welcome. I'm really excited that uh, both Jay and Nicole are here to talk to us about copyright law and and hopefully give us a better understanding of what we should be doing. Um, if you do have questions, um, you can put them in the chat and then at an appropriate time, whether it's part of the discussion we're currently having or if it's something that we'll, we'll get to separately at the end, um, we will try and do that. Um, so please feel free to put anything in the chat. Um, and so I'm going to introduce um, uh, I would like to say Elizabeth Robinson is here with me as well from the Flutes Club Committee to help um, inter you know help moderate this. Um, so I'll start and I'll start with Nicole. And Nicole is a composer and flutist who has composed numerous works for flute. She has won the NFA 2017 Flute Choir Comp Composition Competition, mm. the 2016 to 2020 newly published music awards, an album of her music, Three Nine Line, released in 2018 by MSR Classics and Flute Method Book, Beatboxing and Beyond with Dr. Mary Matthews. With her husband, Brian, they have their own independent music publishing company, Spotted Rocket. Jay Berger is the manager of the licensing and copyright department at both Carl Fisher Music and the Theodore Presser Company. Jay earned his BA from the State University, University of New York at Binghamton and his Juris Doctorate Doctor from the University of the Pacific McGeorge School of Law. Since graduating law school in 1988, Jay has worked in the music industry representing music publishers and record labels. Additionally, Jay has represented recording artists and songwriters from doo-wop artists of the 50s, disco kings and queens from the 70s, old school pioneer hip hop artists, hard rock and heavy metal bands of the 80s and 90s, and many pop and rock music icons, some of whom whom have been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Jay is a frequent copyright lecturer who has spoken at regional and nation, nation music industry conventions. Thank you both for being here. Um, so we had some questions, so we're gonna start with, um, you know, many, many teachers and conductors are unaware of what we actually are allowed to copy. Can you share um, your knowledge on when copying music is allowed? Sure. Copying is, is a tough issue for a lot of people. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, I'll tell you what I take the position at. If you're a teacher and you've purchased, for example, a band work or a choral work or something to that effect, sometimes like the band work will, or the orchestra work will have two violins and you may have three, four or five different violin players in your in your band or orchestra. So what I do is I permit the teachers to make copies. I do not say, no, you can't make the copy. I say, if you need extra copies for the violin section, whether it's violin one or violin two, or if you're a band teacher needing an extra copy for a percussion one, percussion two, because you have so many kids that are playing it, I never say no. And I think it's very evil to say no. So I permit the copy. The only thing I ask you to do if you make the extra copies is that you keep them in your library. You keep them and you maintain them so that the next year, the year after, you're allowed to give those copies to your students as well. Because as we all know, when you purchase a set, for example, a band set, you know, there's always not enough copies. We have to be honest with each other. There's always not enough copies. You always have more students than are uh, parts that are within a set. So there's never a question. Teachers contact me all the time and say the same thing. Go right ahead. Make those copies for your students. With respect to conductors and orchestras, I take the same position. Once you've either purchased the work or rented the work from our rental uh, department, I say the same thing. Go ahead and make the copies. The same thing I say also with um, you know, auditions. If you're a teacher, for example, if you're a high school teacher and you're having auditions for your chamber choir, and they come to me and say, can I make a copy? I said, absolutely. For auditions, there's never a charge for that. So teachers don't, you know, teachers and in, in, in orchestra leaders and conductors, feel free. If you're concerned about it, contact the publisher. The publishers will tell you you can make the copies, but the most important thing you do is contact the publisher, and they'll give you the permission to do it. So definitely, definitely, I say that copies are permitted. I just want you to use your copies for your orchestra, your band, or your philharmonic, or whatever. The only issue that gets kind of sticky is when, for example, another school requests 
from you, hey, can I, can you lend me your copy of this musical score? And that becomes an issue. That's the question is, can you lend it? And the answer, most questions is no, you can't lend it. What you need to have permission from the publisher and the publisher will give you permission. I have never said no to a school that, you know, needs a copy from another school because we all know in these days and age, and I know it from my own kids, is that the arts departments at a lot of high schools and middle schools we don't have a lot of money. We like to buy, you know, a lot of football jerseys and a lot of like, you know, we expand all the sports, but we take away money from art. So that's why my position and a lot of other my colleagues in, you know, the licensing and copyright departments of other um, publishers take the same position that make the copies and you can lend it. Just let us know. Um, a couple of issues always arise. For example, you have a student that is visually impaired. OK, whenever a student is visually impaired, there is no question that we allow you to enlarge in the score. There's never an issue, never a charge for it. Just let us know. Just, you know, ask us a question. Can I do this? And the answer always is yes. I've had situations where um, I've had blind students and there is a program that you can change the music into Braille for these students to follow. And we always say yes. We always say yes to enlarging. We always say yes to Braille. If, for example, if, the, if there's a student that has a hearing difficulty and you want to make a MIDI file of that piece so they can actually hear it, never say no. Okay. So for teachers, just want you to know that the publishers are really on your side on this. And we really want to help you because music is important. And we know that you know you want to have the best you know sheet music, the best availability for your students. So we're always going to do it. Now, copying individual parts, again, go right ahead. There's never an issue of individual parts. I, I never say no to it. When teachers, when individual private lesson teachers come to me and they say they want to make copies of, of certain works and stuff, I say go right ahead. The only issue I have with these sometimes is that when I tell the, the private instructor, it's like when your student has finished learning that piece and is not going to play the piece again, just get it back from him or her. That's the only thing I ask, because I don't want them, the student, to then give it to somebody else down the line, because at the end day, our composers, we want them to continue to compose. And the way that works is that if they make a couple of dollars here and there because of sales or other things, we want that to be the impetus for them to continue this great you know, manufacturing and composing of music. So for purposes of you know, what you can and cannot copy, again, teachers, go right ahead. I never say no to a teacher, whether it's, like I said, band, orchestra, or choral, I never say no. You want to make extra copies? Go right ahead. The only thing I ask for the teachers is just to contact, you know, the publisher and say, hey, can I do this? And we're always going to say yes. It really means a lot to publishing companies and people in my position when the teachers come to us or the orchestra leaders come to us and say, hey, can we do this? Which means you really care about copyright law. So, like I said, copies, they're totally fine. We just want to be apprised when you're making them. And I think you're going to find that's the case mostly throughout this whole discussion is communication with the copyright holders, because everybody might have their own nuances about what they're willing to do. So just better safe than sorry. I mean, you just reaching out and contacting to make sure. On the other flip side, where it gets to be like private teachers copying stuff, that's where I feel a little more funny about it because mm -hmm. I wanna make sure the students understand about copyright. I had this discussion with a student just this week and I'm like, I can't sh my, show my face. And you have this sketch PDF of a living composer's piece. You cannot do that. Like you need to order the piece this week. Um, and he did. Um, but, uh, but those are kind of things I wanna make sure that my own personal students do understand the copyright laws because they do get confused about public domain versus living composers because he was he didn't even know the guy was a living composer I'm like well <laughs> yes <laughs> so and then we it started a discussion about copyright which he was old enough to have you know so just just keep that in mind the differentiation in students yeah there's it's co copyright laws are very interesting the copyright law here in the united states has changed over the years if something was uh, created prior to 1978, it's 95 years, okay? If something was created after 1978, it's the life of the composer plus 70. So what you have to understand sometimes is that something could be public domain in the United States, but it won't be public domain outside the United States. For example, if you have a guy that uh, created a work in 1930, but he or she had great genes and lived till 1985, 
that person is still going to be protected you know, around the world, but they may no longer be protected in the United States. So even if you've reached the 95 years, you always have to check, and I know it sounds a little morbid, but always check to see if the composer is still alive. Because if he or she is still alive, they're probably going to be protected in about 98% of the countries worldwide. So just make sure what you do is just always check, number one, when it was originally copyrighted, and number two, if the composer, if, if he or she is still alive. And that will tell you where you can sell stuff, where you can perform stuff without having to pay, et cetera. Um, I have a long question. My group is called Traveling Minstrels, and we are a flute <clears throat> choir that goes to senior residences and nursing homes and assisted living and so on. Um, we would like to copy the music and send it through the internet to the people who are playing. Is that okay? Okay, so have you purchased the music? Yes, oh yes. Okay, if you've purchased the music and you're just giving it to the people that you're playing with, I permit that because I think that's, uh, you know, sometimes for example, if we go back to a couple of years ago during when COVID was rampant, you know, here, um, that was happening every day because people weren't getting together. So they needed to give the music. And the only way to do that was through the internet. The only thing I ask is that you keep it within your group. So if oh, you yes. purchase the music and you, you know, you want to share it with the people in your group who are going to be performing that work, I'm okay with it. As long as it doesn't go outside of that group that is going to be performing. Okay. And an, and an extra layer of security that I like to, to kind of say, do not send all of the parts and the score to everyone in the ensemble. Send only their part to an individual. Mm -hmm. So that right. way you're not distributing everything. Yeah. And then they go off and take it to a different ensemble. And then it's like, you know, that's the only the other request I usually add on to that. <clears throat> yeah. No, that is that is absolutely one of the important things when someone comes and asks for permission, for permission to do that, we say it has to stay within your organization or your, you know, your choir or whatever it is. It must stay within you. Once you start, the problem happens is once you start uh, sending it to other people, it goes absolutely insane. And then we're running a foul of copyright law and the composers get upset because they hear their music is being all over the place. So basically, uh, you know, what you want to do is only those parts that your your, your choir is, is playing and only those people within your choir or in your group. And there was a question within the chat uh, specifically about purchasing a digital copy and is it okay to purchase one copy and then Xerox the number of copies the group needs? Is there any distinction with that? Okay, um, that since it's 2023 right now, that is the unbelievable question of the time as we speak. Here's the scoop. I'm going to be really honest. What, what we do at my company is, for example, I'll give you um, for a course. We know that in high schools and in middle schools, uh, the choral, the chorus courses and the choral groups, they're not five kids. They're like 25 kids. OK, they're not 10 kids. We know how much they are. So when we see that a teacher purchases like 10, you know, it gets to the point where we say, you know, we know you have more kids. OK, we know you have more kids in that. So that really right now is the, the really is the sixty four thousand dollar question. If you have more than one, for example, for a, a course, if you have more than, you know, five kids, you should be buying, you know, the amount of of you know, the music for each person. I, I'm just going to be brutally honest because it's not fair to our choral composers because they're composing these great choral. And what happens is, is that they're only selling five and then they're making the copies. It's a little different in the band and orchestra world when you talk about like, you know, making different copies of different parts. But if, you know, in the choral world, each kid is getting their own copy of the entire work. So it's a little different in band and orchestra than choral, but we actually do we actually do make the choral departments buy the set number for their kids. So we know, like, you know, we have these conversations, with a lot of the digital distributors like J.W. Pepper. We know when, you know, teachers are buying five, we know there's a little off there. They're off. You know, they're really, they really need to buy more. So we try to make it important. We, what we have now is we created our what's called class sets. 
Okay. So if you, you can buy like 20 or 30, whatever it is, and we actually do give sort of a discount because we know that the, the money's allotted to like chorus groups in high schools and middle schools and, and band and orchestras is not as large. So we're trying to, you know, get into the digital world. We just want to make sure that the teachers are being upfront and honest with us. And if they're buying five, it really, you know, kind of a, a light goes off and says, maybe that's not absolutely correct. So we really want to ask the teachers to purchase the amount for their students. And that's why we have class sets. Again, it's different in like band and orchestra worlds where you're just copying parts because you, you'll have, you've purchased it already and you may have three or four more additional violin or percussion, whatever, but uh, it, it's a tough question now. So there is, you know, the issue right now is how do we just police this, if you, for lack of a better term, we just want to make sure that the teachers are, are being up front with us and they're buying the requisite copies that they need. So um, one of the additional questions is that, um, and this is really specific to a flute choir about digital copies, um, and if people print their own parts, do they have to collect them afterwards? That's what we asked to do. So if you're, for example, if you're in charge of the, of the flute choir and someone has printed the parts, we ask that you do collect them. So it, basically what it does, it just gives us a sense of, we know you're not going to give them to somebody else. They're set for you. So if you've purchased the music and you want to send the, the digital parts to your different people in your group, I'm fine with it. But the only thing I ask you is that you collect it and or destroy it. That's all the thing I ask you to do. Do you have anything to add, Nicole? No, he's okay. covered it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I know we talked a little bit about, um, so we'll move on to the next question. Um, you know, can I copy the score for someone to use when conducting a flute choir? Well, and then, and then to add to that, like, cause we did talk a little bit about enlarging it, or if there is a visually impaired person, you know, and they conduct from an iPad. Okay. Visually impaired person, it is never an issue. Go ahead and do it. Never an issue. Okay. If someone, if a person in a licensing and copyright department gives you a hassle over it, then um, they are the most evil person on the face of the earth. Okay. There has never been a time, and I've been doing this for, I hate to say this, like 30 something years almost. I have never said no. Never said no to anything, any type of enlarging or any type of, like I said, for example, if they're hearing impaired or visually impaired, I've never have a question. I don't have a problem copying the score for someone to use with conducting. I don't have it. I just want you to keep that with you at the end, okay? Or destroy it. If, you, if it's just a copy of it, just destroy it, okay? But as long as you maintain possession, it doesn't go to someone else, I'm okay with it. Yeah, it's always it's always the, the question of distribution. distribution. Like, you don't want it distributed. So if you think this could potentially be distributed to somebody else, like, maybe not do it. Like even yep. if you trust the person, like <laughs> that's right. things exactly. happen by accident, even, you know, like you just get, I'm just going to give it to this one student and then that student takes it. So, I mean, it's just, it's just better safe than sorry. And the next thing you know, that, <sighs> uh, that scores up on either Scribd or, yes. uh, or a PDF, Kate, what, I forgot the, the one in, in Germany, it's up There's on. There's a coffee PDF. Sudden, yes. Yeah. Coffee yeah. PDF. That's it. Mm -hmm. Then you know that. Everybody in the world is using it, and they've never paid for it because someone, some really bad person, is uploaded to one of these sites where it's shared. And technically speaking, that is absolutely against copyright law. Mm. There's no question about it. So that's one of the concerns that the composers and publishers have: is that you know this score somehow is going to get uploaded to one of these you know pirate or or you know these these sites, and then the whole world's going to use. So that's why, to be honest with you, what we do at our company is. This is going to sound weird, but every two weeks we do what's called a Scribd scrub. We go to Scribd and we put in our publishing houses' names. And uh, under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, we then send an email to Scribd saying, take this down because this is still copyright protected. Because it's not fair to either our composers or us that people are using the music for free when it still be under protection. Um, then someone added a, a question um, that they like to um, use a copy to, of the con 
I'll, I'll assume the score to mark up instead of the original from to conduct from again is that okay so here let me tell you the the world of uh rental which is kind of funny basically in a nutshell that's sort of what orchestras do the way it works and you're going to laugh at this is that um when someone wants a score to perform, we send them a copy of the score and they write notes all over it uh, because they want to do maybe a different key or something else or make changes, whatever it is. And, you know, they're permitted to do that. You are absolutely permitted to make, if you want to make changes, you want to, you know, lessen it to fit your time frame. you're absolutely allowed to do that. There's no question that you're allowed to do that. If you've purchased your music or rented the music, you're allowed to do it because then you're performing it. OK, so it's something um, that you're allowed to do. Um, if it's something in the public domain, you are free to do anything that your heart desires. You can make any changes whatsoever. You can make any arrangements you want whatsoever. You don't need permission for anything if you're doing a public domain work, OK, because there is no protection. OK, so go right ahead. If you want to make any changes to public domain works, have at it. I can tell you that in our catalog, we have a lot of public domain works that we have arrangements on, and you're allowed to do it. There's never, never a question, okay? Never, ever a question. But, you know, you can absolutely go ahead and do that. And if you want to make, if you want to, instead of using the, the copy that you bought, if you want to make a copy and then do all the changes on the copy or something like that, totally fine. I, I'm totally fine with it. There's yeah, it's, a, about and it's the same idea with like page turns. Like you need to make a copy so that you don't have to make a ridiculous page turn, um, which, you know, if anybody's ever played my music, there's no good page turn. So you have to, you know, um, and it's, you know, I want a good performance. So do the things you need to do to make that happen. Yeah. And we get that quite, we get that a lot. We get a lot of requests like that saying, hey, instead of ch changing the page, can I do it this way where I can have the whole thing for the person performing? And again, we never say no. So sort of still in this vein of conversation, is it allowable to copy the piano part? Okay, I could tell you what I do. Okay, um, I allow it. I allow to copy the piano part um, because the way performances work, say it's an accompanying or something like that, I absolutely allow to copy. I, there, there's no question. The only thing, again, is I ask you to collect it at the end. That's what I, I just want to make sure you do. So that, it, and I'm, say, I'm not saying that the, the pianist is going to give it to, you know, Tom, Dick, and Harry. I'm not saying that, but I just ask you to collect it because, once again, the idea is, especially if you're performing it, you want to have the best way to perform this work. And if the best way to perform this work is to give a copy uh, make a copy of the piano part so the person can look at it while they're performing, how could you say no? I mean, that's the way performances work. So we never say no. If, if someone contacts me and says, I want to make a copy of the piano part so the person can play while the others are playing, I'm like, absolutely. There's never a question. Um, so before we move on to, I'll say streaming, because that's a big topic as well, um, we have another question that is asking if the piece is out of print, but technically still under copyright, is it okay to look for the missing part from other owners of the piece? Tough one. I don't know this one at all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, He'll... you had a big reaction. I don't oh, know. I want to know okay. what Jay has to so, say. Um... <laughs> The, the question is, okay, so I'm going to give you what's called, um, one of the things you learn in copyright is the, called the first publication rule. Okay, let me explain what that means. The first publication is if I go into Sam Ash today, okay, and I go buy a book that's still under copyright, okay, and I purchase that book, I bought it, you know, I've done the right thing, I paid for it, etc. cetera, I didn't steal it, I come home, and then a friend of mine wants to borrow it, okay? A friend of mine wants to borrow it. Can you let them borrow it? And you know what the answer is? Yes. You can't sell it. You can't rent it. You can't do anything. But if someone wants to borrow that book, okay, from you, you absolutely can give it to them. You need to get it back from them, but you can actually lend out. If you've purchased something, you can lend it out to someone. But 
It cannot stay with them. You must get it back. That's what's called the first publication rule. And what that means basically in a nutshell is that if you've purchased something, you're allowed to give it to someone. Like I said, you can't sell it. There's a, a place, uh, I'll give you a, a really bad story, and this has created a, a hassle. There is a, um, a store in the Midwest. I won't tell you who it is, and I won't tell you where it is, but there's a store in the Midwest that what they were doing were buying pieces from publishers, buying full band pieces, orchestra pieces, etc. They were buying it, and then they were claiming that under the first publication rule, that they could then rent it out to schools, colleges, whoever. And that was absolutely wrong, 100% wrong. The only thing you can do is to lend it to a friend or lend it to somebody. You can't lend it to an orchestra. You can't lend it to, you know, um, a philharmonic in, in, you know, in Southeast Asia or something like that. It's just like you lend it to a friend. That's what the first publication was all about. If you, it, you know, you, people can, you know, I can give this book to somebody. I can let them look at it as long as you get it back. You can't give it to them and then they give it to somebody else and they give it to somebody else. That's not how it works. But like the question says, if you need, if it's out of print and someone else has it, they could absolutely lend it to you. There's no question. I know there were a couple more questions on this topic, but we also want to make sure we get to the streaming discussion. So um, when we have time for questions, we'll we'll get back to the, the questions um, from Laura and Dorley and Martha. Um, so in regards to live streaming and sharing recordings on YouTube, and this has just become a huge topic and, and a huge part of our culture today, uh, what steps do we need to take to make sure we are legally streaming our performances? You need to contact uh, <clears throat> you need to contact the composer and or the publisher. You start you can start with the composer and the composer can tell you who owns that right, whether it's them or the publisher, especially if that composer is living. Just know that a lot of composers aren't on your timeline. So you want to make sure you have a lot of give them some time to respond to you. They may not be able to do it immediately, but you do have to check. Um, and there's things and we alluded, Jay alluded it to it earlier, uh, as far as, you know, these PDF websites, um, it's kind of the same idea, like, and I've had to do it where I've filed a, a DMCA yep, with yep. A YouTube and, and CD Baby and had those recordings taken back down because they didn't get a synchronization license or a mechanical license in the case of the person that made an album without without any uh, my permission um or maybe a new arrangement of my piece um so you know it's 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 something you need to just again communicate um to get somebody's permission to do to to do that and pay the right licensings and fees so the one you need for streaming is a streaming or a synchronization license i think That's right yes yep. um and then uh if you're doing albums and recordings you need to do uh, a mechanical license and that can be secured either by going to a website like harry fox but i'm independent so for someone like me you just contact me and i do it for i am the composer and the publisher so i have all rights of that but composer doesn't necessarily have all of the rights they share it with the publisher um and then if it's like a recording from an album and you're syncing it to like images or video then you also have to get the label involved that recorded the original uh recording so i mean there's some things to consider about who owns the rights so the people that can own the rights are the composer and the librettist or the lyricist if it has words like if you're seeing doing it with a singer that person can also be involved and it's the publisher um, and then once it, you're doing stuff that's already been recorded, it's the um, the performer and the label. Um, and then there's also PROs or public royalty organizations that we have to worry about as well. So it's just the composer can tell you because they give their rights away, can kind of tell you where those things are going. Um, if you're really, really just overwhelmed by all the people, <clears throat> I'd start there. And if they don't respond, then, then you could probably find the publisher which is probably on the bottom of the music there and tells you who has that. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, the world has now changed. Everything, everything is uploaded to YouTube. Everything is mm -hmm. uploaded. Now, the only thing, um, if you're actually doing a recording, the kind of new thing, I don't know if anyone's, you know, it's relatively, it started last year on January 1st, it's called the MLC, which is the mechanical licensing collective. And what's happening now is that if you want just, this is just for audio, not for streaming or anything like that. 
if you want to do, if you want to create a recording and just want to upload it to a digital service provider like Spotify or Deezer or Pandora or any of the digital service providers that are in contract with the MLC, you no longer have to go directly to the publisher. You upload the recording to um, the MLC. And what you do is you tell who the publisher is and who is the um, composer. All of the DSPs now are paying astronomical fees to the MLC, who then pays the mechanical royalty to the publisher. So that's different. But, but if you're doing like a recording, for example, a CD, you're doing it through CD Baby, who sometimes are evil and sometimes not evil, um, most of the time evil. But if you're doing a recording uh, like a CD, or if you're just like selling it on your website or doing it, you're selling digital recordings, you have to get a license. But if you're just going to put it on a digital service provider that is in contract with the mechanical licensing collective, you no longer have to go to the publisher because they are now paying uh, the mechanical license fee. So if you want to do a work, for example, um, that's owned by, say, my company, okay, and you wanted to upload it just to Spotify, you no longer have to say hi to Jay Berger anymore. You could just do it yourself. You just upload it as long as you give the absolute, you know, the information is, publisher and who our composer is so that we'll get the record we'll get the money for that the mechanical as aspect of that but that's how life has changed now and to be honest with you uh it's a great it's a it is something that publishers and composers have been dying for for years over the last um year and a half i believe they've almost it's been over a hundred million dollars the mlc has paid out to publishers who then paid out to composers this is an avenue of money that never existed before. So it is fabulous. Before this, Spotify was paying 0.00000001%. Now they're actually paying real royalty. So um, I have to tell you, it's it's the greatest thing since sliced bread now. And so and, and another caveat uh, about the, the complications of streaming, and some people have had had this issue they have recorded a public domain piece and uploaded it but it was so close to the original sound file of the recording that they'll get a strike from youtube yes. or twitch um and uh and then and then you have to go through the process of like look it's in public domain because what happens is people like university universal music group will just upload all of their uh you know, make their sound files available to the robot that's supposed to go find all of the the, the identical sound files, and so they'll accidentally zap you. Um, but you can you can like appeal to that process and get that reversed. It just will take time. So I know that's especially frustrating for a lot of people, especially recently in the last few weeks. It feels like there's been a real uptick to people who are like recording Bach, and then all of a sudden, like, whoa, you know, I am it's a it's in public domain. You don't know the rights, um, and so you just have to go through that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is a pain because I get those yeah. uh, each each month. I'll get something from the MLC saying these are your public domain work. So the only caveat I also want to give you, if you are arranging the public domain work, you can still get paid through it through the MLC, but you have to write down that this is an arrangement. If you don't write down it is an arrangement, they'll just see Bach, they'll see Mozart, they'll see Beethoven, they'll say public domain, screw you, we're not paying you any money. <laughs> so make sure if you do the arrangement. Put your name down as the arranger. So I'll, I'll ask this just to get clarification. Um, the MLC really, you said it, it's for Spotify and audio files, but not yes. YouTube is not included in that, right? Only It's only audio. If yep. there are times where you can play audio on YouTube only, which is few and far between, because we know YouTube is just video stuff like that. But yes, it's it's just audio. For example, the other people that are on that, which are great, is like Amazon Music, Google Music. I mean, there's when I get my reports each each month, I look at you know who's playing our music. I've never even heard of half of these you know these DSPs. There's so many of them out there now. So the the idea is you can go if if, if you create a work today. Go to the MLC, you can go to their website, and you can see which DSPs are affiliated with them, and then you can upload your work to each and every one of them. And if you do that, there's more opportunity for you to get, you know, you can make decent, it's decent money now. It's not like the old days where you're getting like, you know, one nine hundred seventy-five of a cent. So I implore you do it. It's great. If you guys, you guys are all great, you know, creative people and you, you create this great music. You know what? Upload your tunes, please. I'm I'm begging you to upload so you can make some money. 
That's yeah. what I want you to do. I put the link in the chat for the MLC if you want it. Excellent. Yes, thank thank you. you. And I'll I'll ask DSP is a data streaming provider? Digital service provider. Thank you. So close. <laughs> <laughs> Those computer programmers, we like to know yeah. the acronyms, oh, what yeah. they mean. Um, so one of the questions we have still on this topic is um, in regards to a flute club or a flute group, or um, if there was a live stream performance that they've put up on their website or in YouTube and permission was not gotten, do they need to remove those? I Can mean, it's, al it's, it's always best to be proactive. Like, so my husband worked for a web hosting company. Um, and he was in security, so he dealt with DMCA's quite a bit. Um, and they're always their knee jerk reaction. If there was a problem, they took it down. They took the site down. Um, it just, and then go get permission. So if you find, you know, find yourself in that situation, best to take it down, find out and get it in writing, um, you know, an email or something that says you can do it and then put it back up. I mean, I, you know, there's it's honorable it's a good thing to do and everybody's trying to figure out and trying to learn um it's just you know have good intentions and, and communicate yeah i mean see that's what nicole said about a half hour ago she said the key word is communication yeah that is the key word as long as you communicate with us we're the happiest people on the face of the earth Um, so what about a video of a performance? Uh, do I have to answer that from Phyllis? Phyllis says, I know Phyllis. Do I have to answer that question? Um, okay. A video from a performance. If you're uploading a video to any um, type of service like YouTube or, or Facebook or anything like that, you do need a license. If a video especially is a combination of the audio and visual. So you do need a synchronization license. We take the position that if you're doing that video and you're uploading it, um, you need a license from us. And it all depends really on how much, you know, for, I'll explain to you how I do it. If you, you tell me how long you want to upload the video, we don't charge by uh, the platform. We don't charge if you want to put it on Instagram or Facebook or, or you know, YouTube or we, we don't say, okay, it's going to cost you X for this, X for Y. We just go by time. So if you want to do it for two weeks or a month or a year or five years, that's what we base it on. But yes, it is. it definitely needs a synchronization license and uh, we will have to issue that synchronization license for you to upload um, that video. I'll ask this question. There is a composer publisher who Actually, on his site says, if you do a video or if you do have a YouTube video, send them the link. Is that sort of an implicit permission to be able to put that on YouTube? I don't, oh, I don't boy. think it is. I think, no. I mean, it, it could be a trap, but uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't from... think so. Cause he puts them in his music publishing library. No, sure. Sure. Like, so I, you know, personally, when stuff is on YouTube for me, it helps me out. And it gets me out because I'm a small beans. Um, but like, sometimes I'll request, can you put a link to the sheet music? Because usually people that are watching that are interested in buying. Um, but, but, you know, I mean, it, again, it's from person to person. And, you know, who knows why this, uh, you know, and, and the best part of composing is hearing performances. And that could be why this person has it, because they just want to know it's out there. Um, and maybe they love it and want to use it on their website. Like, with your permission, can I put this performance on my website um, to show how this piece is supposed to be played? Um, so there be, could be many motivations for a composer or publisher to have that link. Um, but yeah, I mean, you you do you still need to like. You might also want to just be like, uh, can can you can you pay me synchronization for that? You know. Um, so you know. I don't no, know. What are your feelings, Jay? Nicole is absolutely <laughs> right on that one. Technically speaking, okay. So the way it works, for example, like my company is when if you're a composer and you sign with us and you give us a work, composer really doesn't have any rights to say you can upload your video to uh, YouTube. It's not the way it works. Once you transfer the copyright and transfer the work to us, we have the right to do it. There have been plenty of times, for example, where our composers have come to me and say, hey, Jay, um, there was this great performance at this you know, orchestra. Would you mind if the composer comes up to me and says that, I'll, I'll probably say yes. I'll probably go right ahead, go upload it. Because again, just as Nicole says, it can only help us. 
it can only help, like, for example, if that video is up on YouTube and three other orchestras or whatever people see it, they'll say, wow, maybe I should program that. Okay. So it does help. So when a composer, whenever a composer comes to me and asks me and says, Jay, would you, would you mind doing this? I never say no, because I look at the bigger picture and the bigger picture is, um, what's it going to get me in the future? And if it does get more performances, then it's a win-win for not only the composer, but for us as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, go, I mean, like I said, when the composer asks, I never say no. If the person comes directly to me, there are times where if I know what, what pieces say, it's a very profitable piece for my company. Okay. I'll go, I'll, like, for example, this happened a, a couple of weeks ago. We have a composer by the name of Shen Yi and she does, the most amazing works um, I've heard of, just, just amazing. So she asked me, would you mind if, if this person uploaded this video of my work, they, they had it at a concert, I'm like, go right ahead. Just as long as they, as long as they say, for example, what Nicole said was brilliant. Could you put the link to our website, you know, underneath it? Could you like just say, you know, Shen Yi, Theodore Presser Company, put the link to the website so that people know where to go. So that's, and I, I'm more than happy to do that. And I think it's a, like I said, it's a win-win from every, for everybody. Yeah. And just to be clear, in case it wasn't clear that like, I'm also, I'm, I, I'm the composer and publisher of all my music. So I own all the rights. A lot of composers um, share that with publishers. And so, you know, it's a, a two, it's a, you know, that kind yeah. of takes precedent over just the composer. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to uh, kind of circle back now to some of the questions. Um, so one of the questions, and excuse me, I just scrolled a little bit. Um, one of the questions is from Laura, and she was asking about what about in a master class where everybody is studying the same music, whether it's one movement or a piece from a larger collection, and the piece isn't in public domain, can it be shared? with the class um, and I'll ask the question shared up on a screen or are you talking maybe shared like photocopies that people can pick up on their way in the door a uh I'm talking about a um like a zoom class where they send the music out um in an email ahead of time like a pdf or something yeah e yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's some hard cheese there to pass. I mean, I don't know how you feel about it, Jay, but that gives me the creepy crawlies. I mean, yes, I would, me I would rather just share a screen, um, because then it's really obvious when someone has printed that out because it's all pixelated and not really readable. But I don't, Jay. What are your, what are your uh, I, professional thoughts here? I am with you one hundred and fifty percent on that one. Yeah, for a master class, uh, uh, listen, I get these requests. I get these requests for master class and and if they want to print uh, like a portion of the sheet music you know we do charge a small fee not a large fee i'm, I'm not going to say we charge you know it could be like 25 dollars, okay but it is it gets a little there gets to be problems when you're giving out you know sheet music and god knows i know everybody's pretty honest and stuff like that but you never know where it's going to end up we have to be honest with each other in this day and age so for master classes we do charge but we charge a nominal fee just to make sure that you know they understand that this is just limited to the master class and that's what they're doing a lot of times for master classes too when the class is over we ask for the instructor in the class um, to you know obtain the copies again mm -hmm. so that we know they're not going to be distributed further yeah and it's the same thing with auditions too like I mean, I've had that with NFA asking for like the alto flute audition for the professional flute choir, you know, it's like, can we use an excerpt? And I'm like, yeah, you know, sure, use an excerpt and then, you know, put a link where they could buy the full thing for me, um, you know, and that just helps me, just me get my music out there to people who may have never, never, ever, ever played my music before, you know, in that instance is helpful. But again, everybody's going to feel a little bit different. Um, so just, again, communicate with with the publisher, number one, and then, you know, composer, Absolutely. if you can't find the publisher. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question is, um, can original copies of music that have been purchased be donated to charitable thrift shops? Or like if I, I'll say, or even like if I purchase something and maybe I ended up with two copies. Can I give it to another organization, the, like the originals, not copies? Okay, 
That's that's another very, very difficult question. Um, I take the position that if you're given to a charitable trust or a charitable organization, um, I say, okay. Okay, with the proviso that when you give it to the charitable organization, that's for if they're going to sell it, fine. If it's, they're going to use it, fine. But it really is just for, for their purposes. And I don't want them uh, then giving it to like 30 different organizations or something to that effect, because then it hurts my component. But I typically, I've had this request come before. And I've always said yes, with the proviso that it either stays with the charitable uh, or if a thrift shop sells it, that, you know, the, the people understand that it can only be purchased by them and, and used by them and they can't sell it to anybody else, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, another question uh, we received is, um, can you scan a piano part and have it sent to the accompanying this tablet? Um, if the, okay, I take the position that that's okay, but as soon as, if you've purchased it, I'm completely fine giving them to their tablet so they can perform it. I have no issue with it as long as that, like, again, after, if you're doing this performance for like, you know, twice or three performances, once it's over, it gets off the tablet. It's, but again, it's, it's hard to enforce, right? Yes. It's just, it's yeah. really, it's really, it's the honor know, society. It's the yeah. honor, you know, it's the yeah, honor I mean, system. it's just being ethical and doing the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to circle back to a, a, an additional. This is about giving away or selling your music when you retire from teaching. Um, so, because I guess that's sort of where I come at that question too. Like, if I have 30 flute choir pieces that I purchased, can I give it to a flute choir to have? Or, you know, and I'm sure that we could come up with all kinds of examples. Well, technically speaking, under the first publication rule, you can. If you've purchased it, okay, if you've purchased that, let's, let's say it's one piece of sheet music, okay, and you've purchased sheet music, you're retiring, you want to give it to a flute choir, that's fine, because under the first publication rule, you can give it to someone, okay, you can, you can lend it to them, you can, especially, if, there are plenty of times when people who retired, they just want to give their music away, it, it, as long as that party that you give it to is not going to sell it, is not going to rent it, is not going to make, like, any profit off of of either, like I said, selling or renting it, I'm fine with that because you've already purchased it. Okay, once you purchase it, that's what you can do after the fact is you can give it to somebody, you can lend it to somebody, et cetera, et cetera, as long as they don't make money off of it. That's where the first publication will stops. It stops when that second party then is gonna, like I said in my example with that place in the Midwest, that they were renting, they were buying the one piece and then renting it out to people. As long as you're just gonna use it, I have no problem with it. So just because I've seen this on a number of the flute chat groups where people have their big catalog of things and they say, I'm selling this and this box will have this and it's $20. And so that's not giving it away because that's no. separate from postage, that's, right? So clearly separate, give it yeah. away. Yes, give it away. Yep. Okay. So another question we have, um, and, and this is from Miriam. Uh, she's asking if there are any tips on what to do when reaching out to publishers slash rights holders to ask for permission to create a derivative work, for instance. She's not a professional, and she was wondering if there, you had any thoughts. Is this about arranging something that's already pre-existing? Uh, I think so. Okay. But uh, I, I'm not, if Miriam wants to clarify, if you want to unmute. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm asking about asking permission uh, to arrange and just if, if there are any things that like um, that if, if if you're, you know, a publisher or, or a rights holder and s someone says like, I'm, I, I want to play your violin piece on flute, mm. um, you know, like what kind of things they should, you know, ask for or explain. It gets sticky, doesn't it? Like, it, it, it's like if you're as long, you know, when... <laughs> I don't like it, but I mean, I know it's legal, 
like if you play like because we all know like violin has a wider range than flute right but if the range of the violin falls within the flute and you just play it on flute like i hate sharing this but like you could i don't think you need permission uh, but if you're changing things, then you need, that's when you need permission. So like if you have to, like if it falls out of the range of the flute, I think it's starting to get sticky, you know, where you're going to an A below, below the B foot of a flute and you have to pop that up an octave or some other things and you're changing. That's when it becomes an arrangement and that's when you have to start getting people involved, like the publisher who I'm a little fuzzy about who because I don't have to deal with it uh, about about if you can make that arrangement um, and I think it is even more complicated if it's not in public domain then the composer also has to get involved I think maybe um, so I'm going to let Jay get the stickiness of it but like um, but yeah I mean and I, I know if anybody's ever asked me like I don't want people making arrangements of my stuff because that re misrepresents my choices and so I like to do the arrangement myself it's just kind of like how if someone used a headshot of you in an advertisement that you don't endorse, kind of think of it that way. Like, would you want that? Um, and so that's kind of like, I don't, that's how I perceive uh, arrangements, um, especially when I'm really sticky about instrumentation and how it's very unique to the situation. Um, but Jay would probably have more experience on that front. Yeah, on the arrangement front is, um, so we do permit arrangements. Um, uh, we do permit it. The way arrangement works is that you tell us what you're going to arrange, whether it's for a different instrument, whether it's something here, something there. Um, we will give you permission, but an arrangement you must understand is that the copyright to the arrangement is still going to be owned by us as the publishing company because you're using a pre-existing protected work. You will get an arrangement credit, okay? But the copyright does belong to, for example, if it's a Theodore Presser work, the Theodore Presser company. Now, there are different things for arrangement. I mean, if it's a, there are different types of arrangements. One is an arrangement to perform. You may want to just do this arrangement to perform at various concerts, et cetera. Or sometimes you actually, believe it or not, um, get an arrangement to print, whereby the person's going to create this new arrangement. They're going to print it. So that's a combination license of a arrangement and print so that we will share in those print license fees as well. But yes, for an arrangement, when you contact the publisher and the places that you want to go to make it easy for you is either go to BMI or ASCAP or even Harry Fox, you'll find the publisher, send an email to the publisher, or even like, for example, if you were doing it for our company, if you go on our websites, uh, you'll see where it says, uh, do you want a license? And then you go in there and you fill out the form for the license and explain to us what you're doing. And I have to tell you, unless it's absolutely insane, and I've had some absolutely insane arrangements, we don't say no. I mean, if I could tell you that our song was used in um, uh, in this crazy TV show, uh, and I, you know, we said yes to it. It came out, thank God it came out okay, but I thought it was going to be really bad. But um, technically, we will grant an arrangement, but you understand the arrangement, the copyright to the arrangement is owned by us because the work is still protected under the copyright laws. And there's things like if you want to do, I mean, like arrange stuff. Um, uh, I do love actually I do I do love sheet music plus or arrange me.com if you like a pop song or something because they can give you a quick and dirty license. Um, they take a big cut like I think it's uh, they take 80% um for so it is it is a big cut but you can get it free and out there if you want to do something for fun like i the one thing a lot of flute choirs of mine have done are metallica's enter sandman that i did for flute choir and i did it through that um and so then i didn't have to go through the hustle of doing it when i just wanted to play with my flute quartet um now the the caveat is there the exception there is that i cannot print it bind it and sell it myself it lives digitally forever on that until i want to take it down which i do have rights to i could just take it down and not have it there. Um, they're very flexible with your contract. You can just end it with them on that piece immediately. They're very forgiving about that. And then as far as originals and having them publish, it's they take 50% of the original, which can be better than, than most public publishers. But again, it would only live in PDF world. Yeah. Um, so, the, so those are things to consider if you're trying to do arrangements of, of pop songs. They have a lot of licenses. It's crazy the amount, yeah. Um, there are a couple of more questions in there. Um, 
I don't know if maybe it would be easier, but can you either repeat the dates for the, mm -hmm. the things that are in public domain or maybe type them in the chat? Sure. Um, go ahead and do that. Just, just uh, yes. It's uh, it depends. I'll, I'll type in the chat. It just depends when the, you know, the copyright was was done. And so, I'll, like for example, everything now I think it's 1927 and yeah. earlier, or 1928 and earlier is PD because it's 95 years. But I'll, I'll put it in the chat and I'll I'll I'll, say the, I'll tell you the roles in the chat. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and then one question we have is about, um, there's some confusion to, to, and I'm sure we all have it, um, about synchronization license process. Um, and, and in particular, uh, she's asking if her students are performing for a recital and we want to post the performances to YouTube, whom do we need to contact? The publisher. Mm -hmm. You need to contact the publisher. Now, I will tell you what we do. We do it differently than some other publishers. For example, if a school wants to do like a one day live stream, if it's a high school or a junior high or even elementary school, I will not charge if you're just doing it for the length of the concert or just one day. I do not charge for that. Okay. If you want to keep that video up for say 30 days or six months or a year, then I charge a, a, a small fee. We don't charge very large fees for like uh, recitals or, you know, like, for example, like my kids, uh, I am not a musician, but all my kids are. And, you know, when they do their, you know, their winter concerts and their spring concerts, um, we never charge for the live stream because it's a high school because we know the schools don't have money. If it's just a one hour or two hour thing, we won't charge. But if they're, if you're putting up for an extended period of time, we will charge a minimal fee. We will. Um, so just a quick question. Someone was asking about putting new lyrics to a familiar song and the original song is not in public domain. Depends okay. if it's a parody or not. Like, you know, Weird Al does, you know, that's, that's parody. So it's, but it, away Weird that, Al, but... you know, his parody, it, what's great about Weird Al, and you're going to laugh about this, Nicole is absolutely 100% correct. He doesn't have to pay because if he does a parody, but you know what? He pays, he puts down the original authors on it yeah. because he's a good guy. Now, technically speaking, if you're putting new, if you're not doing a parody and you're doing new lyrics to a song that's not in the public domain, that is typically called a sample, okay? Because what you're doing is you're sampling the musical instrumentation and putting new lyrics. So you're going to have to contact the publisher. You're, what typically happens, and like for, I'll give you an example. Gucci Mane did a song called 12 Days of Christmas and used one of our songs. We have one of our big Christmas songs called Carol of the Bells. You've probably heard it 10 gazillion times all over the, you know, all over the place. So what they did was they added new lyrics. So what they gave me a copy of the work. So they sent it to me. I listened to it. I calculated the amount of time that my lyrics were in it as opposed to other lyrics. And that's a sample use. So they were sampling my lyrics. What you're doing now, you're using the music and you're doing new lyrics to the music. You're going to have to send that completed piece to the publisher so they can go over it. And then they'll give you um, what they believe is the fair distribution on the copyright to that new song because you're adding 100% new lyrics. So you're going to share in that copyright. That is a sample use. And you're going to have to get permission to do that from the publisher. I just put a link in the chat about working with lyricists and the collaboration and how that kind of all like gets married together that newmusicusa.org put together. So if you want to learn more about how composers and lyricists work together and how their royalties are kind of shared or split um, and how that original piece like you can't kind of separate it. Um, there's a wonderful article about it in the chat. I'll, I'll sneak in this one last question um it's about copyright and how it, and it's a for an arrangement and how does that affect copyright if it's just for performance and not for sale or publication is there really a distinction yes there is so we have several types of arrangement license one is an arrangement to perform and one is an arrangement to sell OK, so if you're going to arrange a, a piece just to, you know, do it three or four different performances, you're going to be charged an arrangement license fee and then you'll be charged fee for performing that fee afterwards. 
Okay, so we charge um, not just the arrangement, but it's not a huge charge again, but there, it's a, two different types of licenses. It's an arrangement to perform and arrangement to print. So your performances, you'll be paying for. It's not a lot of money again. You just have to tell us, for example, that I'm going to arrange X work and I'm going to perform it one, two, three, four, five times. Where, where am I performing it? And that's how we come up with a fee. But yes, there, that is an arrangement to perform license that you'll have to get from the publisher. Well, our time is up. I'm sure that we could have so many more questions. I just want to thank both Jay and Nicole for your time and your expertise in helping to hopefully clarify some of the questions that we clearly all have about this topic. So thank you all so much. Pleasure. Right, and I just you. put the chat again, all the links we kind of talked about to the on the the website so you can find them again um, and read all those articles because this we covered a lot in a little bitty amount of time and there's so much yeah. to this topic. Yeah, I'm going to put in the chat, um, I'm going to put in chat uh, the issues about copyright. I'm going to put my email address in case anyone has any questions that uh, were not answered. Something like that. I can always feel free to contact me and I will try to answer it like a normal human being. <laughs> so many emails. You're about to get so yeah, many emails, I know, sir. <laughs> I know. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Jay. I always Thank learn you. something. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.